Okay, let's start out with a sort of estimation problem that originates in the video clip you're going to see in a minute. So what you're going to see in a moment is a video of a, an earthquake in Tokyo from several years ago. And you'll see the top of a kind of dark colored building, a, co a building with a very dark colored facade, kind of swing back and forth like this. And I was trying to estimate both the amplitude and the period of oscillation. And the period is easy because you can basically just count the number of times it goes back and forth and count off seconds on a stopwatch. The amplitude is a little harder, but the way I estimated the amplitude, and you could tell me if you get a different answer, but I said, well, okay, one story. You, know, you can kind of tell from the pattern of the windows how tall, uh, where a story is vertically. And a story should be like three or four meters. You know, so like uh, 10, 12 feet. And uh, then I said, okay, uh, that's, that's vertically that's a story. So now I know horizontally what would correspond to like three or four meters. And then I say, okay, if I see it going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, then from extreme to extreme is two times the amplitude. Since the cosine wave goes up to one times the amplitude and then back to zero and then down to minus the amplitude and then back up to plus the amplitude. So extreme to extreme distance is two times the amplitude. So I said, okay, I think you know, the extreme to extreme distance in the video corresponds to something like half a story was my guess. So, so which would be something like two, so an amplitude of about one meter. And then I estimated the period of about four seconds. So the reciprocal of that would be the frequency is about a quarter of a hertz. So a quarter of a cycle per second. And then remember our expression. Uh, so amplitude times cosine of two pi times frequency times time. And uh, now, if you're just sitting in this office building, uh, then if you're not looking out the window, you're just sitting at your desk, maybe in the interior of the building, uh, you can't really detect the change in position of the building. And you also don't really detect the velocity of the building. I mean, if you're riding in a, in a train or if you're on a smooth car ride, you don't uh, you don't notice how fast you're going, but what you do notice is acceleration. If, the, if, the, if you change direction or if you speed up or slow down, you can feel that even with your eyes closed. So what you're going to detect in the building is the acceleration. So I said, okay, first derivative of the position versus time is the velocity versus time, and the next derivative is going to be the acceleration versus time. So this is our expression for acceleration that we used last week minus 2 pi frequency all squared times amplitude times this cosine expression. So the biggest value you get for acceleration is when the cosine takes the value 1. So it's just, uh, well, and, and also uh, the magnitude. So we don't need the minus sign. So 2 pi times the frequency all squared times the amplitude is the maximum acceleration in magnitude. Uh, so we can plug in. I plug in a meter as my estimate for the amplitude and a quarter of a hertz for my estimate for the frequency. And I put the numbers in and I get the maximum acceleration is about two and a half meters per second squared, which is about a quarter of a G, right? A G is 9.8 meters per second squared. So that's amazing, actually. That's a huge acceleration. So that would be very uncomfortable for the occupants of the top floor of this building. So uh, I looked up some numbers. You can just barely feel accelerations that are about 0.005 g or larger. So that's like a 200th of a g or larger. And then you start to feel a little uncomfortable for accelerations bigger than about 0.02 g or so, 2% of a g or so. So putting this into, so 0.02 g is 0.2 meters per second squared. So 0.2 meters per second squared starts to feel somewhat uncomfortable this is two and a half meters per second squared. This is like more than 10 times that threshold. So I would say this would be very uncomfortable for the building occupants. I'd say the people that you're watching, uh, if there's anybody up there at the top story of that building, of course, you know, it's going to be a smaller effect down to the lower floor. But up, if you're up in the top floor of that building, uh, moving with that big amplitude, uh, I think uh, I think you're going to find that really uncomfortable. So then keep that in mind as you watch the video for about 10 seconds, and then we'll go on from there. Osama, Osama, Osama. 
まったんですかね大丈夫あれ。Okay, these are some wave animations that I made with a little Python program, the Python version of processing. So you see, that was a positive pulse coming from the left, an equal size positive pulse coming from the right, and when they overlap, they interfere constructively. Now you're going to see a positive pulse coming from the left and a negative pulse of the same size coming from the right. And they're going to interfere destructively while they overlap. And then you're going to see two pulses of different size. So they differ by a factor of two in size. You'll see them overlap. It's more interesting to see what happens when they have opposite signs. So next you're going to see two pulses of opposite sign and differing by a factor of two in size. So then they do not cancel quite completely while they overlap. Now you're going to see uh, what looks like this is my simulation of the rope with different boundary conditions on the two ends. And you can try to guess for a minute what the boundary condition is on each side. But basically, the left side is immobilized. So it's fixed. So then the reflection always comes back with the opposite sign. And the right side is free. So it always comes back with the same sign reflection. Another thing you'll notice is that the point on the very left of uh, is always uh, 0, whereas the slope on the very right is always 0. Now this is taking two traveling waves, two harmonic traveling waves, uh, in opposite directions, same amplitude, and adding them. And you see, when you add them, they make a standing wave. So this is a way, one way to make a standing wave, is you have a traveling wave to the right and a traveling wave to the left, both sinusoidal in nature. And when they overlap, you get a standing wave. That only works if they are the same amplitude. So I think what we're going to see next is the same thing we saw a moment ago, but there is a slightly different. Oh, I see one is positive, one is negative. This also works. So they have opposite. Instead of having the same sign, they have opposite signs, but this also creates a standing wave. But then what you're going to see in a moment is if they have different amplitudes, then they don't quite create a standing wave. They create a wave that does a really weird kind of shuffle. It sort of goes, it's going to look as if it hesitates and goes and hesitates and goes and hesitates and goes. I hope we don't see that yet. We'll see that in a moment. And I put the source code for these animations on the web page in case you're interested in how I did it with Python. So here you see they have different amplitudes. So you get this kind of funny pattern where it, it almost looks like a standing wave, but then it shuffles. So it kind of goes slowly, quickly, slowly, quickly, slowly, quickly. So it, so it really does not, does not make a standing wave. It makes a kind of funny slip sliding traveling wave. So to get a good standing wave, you have to have two sinusoidal waves going in opposite directions, same amplitude. So now this is the one half wave fits on the string standing wave patterns. This is like the lowest mode for a guitar string. So here you see half of a wave fits on the string emulating standing wave. And then we're going to see the case where one whole wave fits on the string. That'll be there in just a, just a moment. OK, here's one whole wave fits on the string. Now we're going to have one and a half waves fit on the string. So 
you can see there's a node about a third of the way across and there's another node two thirds of the way across. Now two whole waves should fit on the string. So you have nodes a quarter, a half, and three quarters of the way across the screen. I think that might be as far as I go. Let's see. Okay, so now we have two and a half waves fit on the strings. So there's one, two, three, four, yeah, there are nodes at 20%, 40%, 60%, 80%. So that's uh, two and a half waves fit on the string. And now three full waves fit on the string. And I think finally this is all my program does. A moment ago, we saw standing waves on the transverse wave machine. So at certain, if I shook the end of the wave machine at just the right frequency, then we could fit exactly one half wave on the wave machine, or exactly one wave on the wave machine, or exactly one and a half waves on the wave machine. So the number, if you, uh, if we choose, well, if we immobilize both ends of the wave machine, so this end is completely fixed, this end is completely fixed, and then if we wiggle the middle of the wave machine at just the right frequency, uh, and remember the relationship between the wavelength and the frequency is related by the speed of wave propagation on the wave machine or on a guitar string or in whatever medium. Then we got, uh, we, we could choose just the right frequency so that one half wavelength fits on the string or on the wave machine. So like here's an example of one half wavelength fitting on the string. If I have two ends of the string fixed, here's one complete wave fitting on the string. If I have the two ends of the string fixed, and then a version I didn't draw, but I could draw is, you know, one and a half waves. So you get, if you, if you anchor the two ends of the string, then the possible uh, standing wave modes on that string are that an integer number of half wavelengths fits on the length of the string. So usually we're interested most in the fundamental mode where a half wave fits on the string. And uh, I mean, what you actually get if you pluck a guitar string might be some uh, mixture of the fundamental mode and its overtones, but uh, still you know, what we hear the most is the fundamental mode. And then, uh, I guess you, you sort of know that on a guitar string, I mean, we have, it's usually we have intervals, I think, of uh, a fourth, a fourth, a fourth, a third, and a fourth, I think. Although I don't really know anything about music, so maybe I got that wrong. So, but you know, we're going to go, as we go uh, from string to string, we're going up in pitch on the fundamental mode. say what accounts for that.
And as we worked out on the light board, the fundamental, well, the, the possible frequency, so n equals 1 in that equation I wrote down there is the fundamental mode. So the fundamental mode will have a higher frequency if we make the tension in the string higher. I don't want to do that to these strings right now. I have another guitar I'll do that too. The fundamental mode frequency is lower if the mass per unit length of the string is bigger because the mass per unit length of the string is downstairs. And you can see that on a guitar from the fact that the lowest frequency strings tend to be made of much heavier material and the highest frequency strings tend to be made of much less heavy material so the diameter of the string is bigger here so it's a bigger mass per unit length this is a smaller mass per unit length you also see that downstairs well, it's a little bit tricky. So the mass per unit length is a property of the string material. So even though I have L downstairs in that square root, you can sort of ignore that once you say, okay, I'm picking a kind of string, so that has a certain mass per unit length. So now you just have that one factor of L downstairs outside the square root. So you say, if I make L smaller, the resonant frequency should become higher. And I think you can see that happen like I really don't know anything about guitars, but I think eh, I'm going to try to play a major scale. Let's see. So what I'm doing as I'm going up is I'm making the length of the same string smaller and smaller. And by making the length of the same string smaller and smaller, I'm making that fundamental frequency for what's left of the string bigger and bigger because that length is downstairs. I can also show you what the tension does. I'll do that with a real cheapo guitar here. You don't want to be hearing any unhappy guitar sounds. So we can try, take the same string and let's increase its tension. And the way we do that is we just uh, adjust this little screw on the end and it and it winds it around a cap stand that increases its tension. So let me see if I can increase its tension. Actually, I don't even know which way I turn this. Let's see. So it seems as if I'm decreasing its tension here. Let me go the other direction. I'll increase its tension. So increase the tension, the fundamental frequency goes up. Decrease the tension, the fundamental frequency goes down. Now those are frequencies you can easily hear, They're kind of in the hundreds of hertz. Let's go to a frequency that we can see. Or almost see. So right now you're looking at this piece of string. So this I actually measured out pretty approximately because I just used a kitchen scale with a few meter length of string, but I measured the mass per unit length of this string to be about two grams per meter. It wasn't a great measurement. I took a three meter length of it and my kitchen scale said six grams, but it might have been, you know, five and a half or six and a half. And so we know the mass per unit length roughly of this string. So I'd say like 0 0.002 kilograms per meter. And then what's the tension of this string? So to fix the tension of this string, we took some little weights and we're dangling little weights from the end over here. So we have, we have some little weights that look like this. So these are calibrated. This one is 200 grams. That's two-tenths of a kilogram, uh, and so on. So we have a total mass on the end of this string of 400 grams, which is 0.4 kilograms. And so if you multiply that by little g, 9.8, you get four, roughly four newtons, just a little under four newtons. So I said, okay, the tension is about 4.0 newtons. The mass per unit length is about 0.002 kilograms per meter. And then I measured out the length of the string. 
And the length of the string turns out to be about one and three quarter meters. Let me do that for you. So here's my handy dandy tape measure. And okay, so we get about 1.75 meters for the length of the string. And if you plug all that stuff in, then uh, I worked out that the fundamental frequency, so that's where n equals one in that expression, should be about 12 or 13 hertz cycles per second. Uh, okay, so now let's see what we have to do. So right now this string is shaking up and down at about two hertz, two times per second. So I'm gonna dim the lights so you can see the string a little better. And then I'm going to tune the frequency until you see very clearly that one half wave fits on the string. And then we'll go up and we'll look for the other modes. So let me just pardon me for a moment while I dim the lights. Okay, so I'm going to gradually increase the frequency. That's four cycles per second, four hertz. There's five cycles per second, five hertz. There's seven, eight, nine, 10 cycles per second. 11, okay now 12 or 13 was my prediction from the input numbers. There's 13, but it seems that it actually wants to go just a little bit higher than that. I got about 15 a moment ago. That's too high. Oh no, I, oh, that's pretty good actually. Yeah, that's actually pretty decent. Okay, yeah, so that's 15.2. If we go a little bit higher, see that's not so good. And if we go a little bit lower, that's also not so good. It seems like Right around there seems to be the most obvious standing wave where you see half a wave on the string. So it's sort of like, well, I don't think you can see this anymore, but it's sort of like the picture I drew here with half a wave on the string. Yeah, so that looks pretty decent. So now the next frequency where we should be able to get a pretty dramatic effect is twice that. So this is 15.2. So if we go up to 30.4, we should see a pretty good standing wave, but instead of half of a wave on the string, we should see a whole one whole wave on the string. Let's see that. So that's pretty good. So now you see a pretty convincing one whole sine wave on the string. 
So that's uh, 30.6 cycles per second, 30.6 hertz, which hertz, which is double the roughly double the 15.2 we saw a moment ago. So there's a little, you know, I say 15.2, maybe it was closer to 15.3. Let's go up. So now the third mode should have one and a half waves on the string. So that should be a triple our original frequency. So that should be about 45.6 maybe 45.9, somewhere between 45 and a half and 46 cycles per second. Let's try that. pretty good. That's 44.6. Let me see. 44.7, 44.9, somewhere in that range. Okay, pretty close to 45 hertz. We see a pretty nice convincing uh, one half, two halves here. So to the end, that's one half. And that's two halves, that's three halves, so we have one and a half waves fit on the string. Remember, because a sine wave goes like that. And let's do the next one, it should be around 60 hertz. the energy is dissipated into friction more and more quickly so it becomes harder for us to excite the string. But this is pretty decent. That looks like two whole waves. So there's the end. There's a half wave. There's two halves. There's three halves. There's four halves. So two whole waves at 60 hertz. That might be all we get. Let's try the next one. So the next one should be around 75. This was 57.3. this earlier. Earlier we tried to get the 75-ish hertz mode to work and we didn't really, oh, hey, that's actually not bad. Oh, that's close. I think that's pretty close. Let's see. It actually looks pretty good. end. There's one half. There's two halves. There's three halves. There's four halves. 
five halves. Okay, so we got five half wavelengths at, this was 71.8 hertz. I think that's probably gonna be the best we do, let's see. Okay, so then we wanna go up close to 90. I grew up in Boston, so I say 90. So, good too. You can kind of see that. Gee, this is working better than I expected. Okay, so about at about 86.1 hertz we see there's zero there's one half there's two halves there's three halves four halves five halves six halves pretty decent so we need three whole waves fit on the string there pretty good all right okay now I guess one thing we could do we can go back to Let's go back to the 13, 15 ish, 15.2, I guess, was our fundamental mode. Yeah. Okay, now if we double the tension, keep everything else fixed then we should increase the fundamental frequency by the square root of 2. So instead of being around 15 hertz, it should be like around 21, 22 hertz. So let's try that. So again, if we go from 400 grams, 0.4 kilograms, to 800 grams, 0.8 kilograms on the end of the string, then I claim instead of 15 hertz, we should see something, well, 15 times, square root of two is 1.414 roughly. So that's gonna be a little less than 22 hertz. Let's try that. So I can add over here. So we have 400 grams now. Here's two, three, four. So there's another 400 grams we'll add to it. So now we have 800 grams over there. So now we should see, so we just doubled the tension. And because of the square root, then we should see about 40% higher, 1.4 times for the fundamental frequency. So I claim it's gonna be around 21, 22, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 seems like, let's see, where do we get, oh, that's pretty nice. Okay, 20.5 is where I get the nicest response there. So yeah, that's pretty decent. 100. 100, 100, 100. Okay, so we went from 400 to 800 grams. Now let's go from 800 to 1200 grams. So that's gonna be three times the original tension. The square root of three is about 1.7. So it should be 1.7 times the original fundamental frequency. And if you take that 15 hertz times 1.7, three, square root, 1.732. And we multiply that by the original 15.2 that we were looking at a moment ago. It should be about 26 hertz. 
So we should see a, res of a fundamental frequency of about 26 hertz if we add this additional 400 grams of mass to the end there. Let's see what happens. I've never tried this before. Okay, so I expect it to be something like 26 hertz. I haven't peeked yet to see where it is. Let's see where it is. 25.2, hey, that's not bad. So 25.2 hertz is where we get the really nice fundamental mode response. And then again, okay, there's 25.2, so if we go to about 50 hertz, we should see a whole sine wave here. See a whole sine wave, very nice. It's about 74 hertz, we see one and a half sine waves. Okay, so you get it, you get the picture. While I'm here with the speaker and with this device called a function generator, which can generate a sine wave of whatever frequency I like, let me just illustrate for you uh, what happens when we play an adjustable frequency sound out through this speaker so you can hear it for yourself. I have the amplitude, the volume turned way down. So let me turn the amplitude up a little bit. So this is 880 hertz. So that is known as A5 on a piano. Let's go down to four, we'll go down gently, gradually, we'll go down to 440 and that'll be A4 on a piano. Okay, so that's 440, which is known as A4 on a piano. And then we could go down to 262, which is known as C4 on a piano, or middle C. back up to A4 just because it's pretty easy to hear. Well, okay, there's C4. And 
What I've been playing so far is a sine wave. Let's hear what a triangle wave sounds like of the same fundamental frequency. You'll hear, instead of sounding flute-like, it will sound a little bit more tinny. You'll hear a little bit more high frequency content. And now let's play a square wave of the same fundamental frequency, and it will sound like a 1980s Atari video game, like much more high frequency content. Now let me go back down to C4. That's the square wave. That's the triangle wave. That's the sine wave. And the idea is, uh, so frequency is a fundamental idea for vibrations, for waves, for sound. Uh, so to your ear, frequency corresponds to pitch. So for a vibrating object like a pendulum, frequency is the number of cycles per second. Uh, mathematically, frequency is a parameter of a sine function, like uh, you know 2 pi ft, so the f in 2 pi ft is the frequency. Um, so motion that is purely sinusoidal, also known as simple harmonic motion, contains only a single frequency. So the sine function represents a kind of a building block, a kind of simplicity in describing things that are periodic. So there's this amazing math result, I think it's a math 114 result, called Fourier's theorem that tells us how to build up more complicated functions by adding up sine functions of different frequencies. It actually might be a math 240 result. Okay, so uh, for example, you can build up a square wave that repeats itself once every t seconds by adding up sine of 2 pi time over big T to t, big T per period. So basically, it's frequency f plus one third of frequency 3f plus one fifth of frequency 5f plus one seventh of frequency 7f. So like a 110 hertz square wave is the same as a 100 hertz sine wave plus one third of a 330 hertz sine plus one fifth of a 550 hertz sine and so on. So I'm just graphing here the first term, then the sum of the first two terms, then the sum of the first three terms, and so on. You can see once you get to like five or six terms, you get a pretty decent square wave. So a square wave is actually just made up by like building up uh, different sine waves f, 3f, 5f, 7f. But for the square wave, uh, the uh, 3f is one third in, in amplitude. The, so if you take f with full amplitude, then it's 3f with a third amplitude, 5f with a fifth amplitude, 7f with a seventh amplitude. By contrast, if you go to the triangle wave, triangle wave turns out to be f with full amplitude, and then 3f with 1 9th amplitude, actually opposite sign, but minus 1 9th amplitude. And then you have 5f with 1 25th amplitude, and then 7f with minus 1 49th amplitude. So it's, see, so each of these, in the, in the case of a square wave, we had f, 3f, 5f, 7f, and the coefficients go like the harmonic, uh, down there, single power, so like one third, one fifth, one seventh. In the case of the triangle wave, it's one and then the square of one third, and then the square of one fifth, and then the square of one seventh. So what that means is that the high frequency, so if you take the sine wave all by itself, I guess you can see that in the blue curve here, uh, there's only one frequency. 
you take the square wave, you have the higher frequencies, and the higher frequencies have uh, they, their weights die out pretty slowly, like one third, one fifth, one seventh. If you take the triangle wave, the higher frequencies weights die out much more quickly, one one ninth, one twenty fifth, one forty ninth. So then, when you play the tone, uh, if you, when you hear the sine wave, it sounds like a nice pure tone. When you hear the triangle wave, you can hear the overtones, but not too harshly. When you hear the square wave, you hear the overtones pretty harshly because the overtones in the square wave have a much larger relative proportion than those same overtones do in the triangle wave. You don't really need to remember this, but it's kind of an interesting fact. So you can hear the difference between a sine, a square, and a triangle. So the sine sounds like kind of like a flute or woodwind instrument. The square has that really harsh sound of like a 1980s Atari video game. And the triangle is somewhere in between. In the triangle, you can hear the overtones, but not with quite so much uh, volume. So these are different waves, that sine wave you heard, the triangle wave, and the square waves. They're the same fundamental frequency, but they have different mixtures of overtones. And different mixtures of overtones are one facet of what you would call timbre, or tonal quality, in a musical instrument. So kind of what makes one musical instrument uh, sound like you know, it's uh, sound different from another musical instrument playing the same frequency. It's kind of the uh, how much of the different frequency content do you get? I mean, there are other details too, but that, that's a significant part of it. What I'm doing here is driving one end of the wave machine with a periodic generator, a little motor going up and down. This end of the wave machine is clamped. It's immobilized with a big mass. So this isn't moving. And if we look around here, it seems as if we have a pretty good node right here. This point isn't moving. And then we go a little bit more, and I think if you look right around here, it's not quite perfect, but there's a decent node here, so this isn't moving. And then the far end is moving just a little bit because that's where we're driving it from, but that's a pretty tiny amplitude. So there's basically a zero, maybe a little beyond the end here, approximately the end, and here, and here, and then at this far end. So we have three half wavelengths. There's one half, two half, three halves. We have three half wavelengths fitting on Maybe it ends up being a tiny bit more than the full length of the wave machine. And now let's see if we can do something quantitative with that. Let me turn the lights back on. And the first thing we want to know is how long is the wave machine? So it seems as if the full length of the wave machine is 1.73 meters. And then the frequency we're driving it at is, I just tuned it until I saw a pretty good standing wave. So this is 0.61 hertz. And then we have one and a half wavelengths fitting on the whole length of the machine. So then the wavelength must be two thirds of the length of the machine is 1.15 meters wavelength. Then to see if things fit together quantitatively, we want to disconnect this function generator, this little motor that's going up and down periodically. Now let's disconnect the little motor and see if we can figure out how long it takes a pulse to go back and forth. We're gonna say, how long does it take a pulse to go from this end all the way down there and back? You can try measuring from home, too. OK, 
Okay, that was about five and a half seconds. Let's try it again. That was about five and a quarter seconds. Let's try it again. That was about five and a quarter seconds. So let's say it takes about 5.3 seconds to go two lengths of the wave machine. So that gives us a wave speed on this machine. Okay about 0.65 meters per second. And then, let's see, so we expect the speed of wave propagation to equal the product of the frequency times the wavelength. So let's try that. We'll take the freq frequency was 0.61 hertz, 0.61. And then we'll multiply that by our wavelength, which was 1.15 meters. And the calculator says 0 0.70 meters per second. And we got 0.65 meters per second. So that's pretty good. That's like within 10%. Hey, not bad. So right now I am driving this end of the wave machine with a little motor that goes up and down, up and down, up and down at a frequency that can be adjusted with this box. And this is a pretty high frequency right now for this wave machine. But you can see this is 3.6 hertz, 3.6 cycles per second. It's just kind of a number that I picked arbitrarily. And at the other end, way down here, what's making all this dinging noise is I have a little dash pot. It's a little, little jar of water that uh, is trying to take most of the energy out of the wave when it reaches the far end here. So we know that the wavelength is proportional to the speed of wave propagation and inversely proportional to the frequency at which we shake the end of the wave machine. So we have uh, wave speed equals wavelength times frequency. So wavelength equals wave speed divided by frequency. So if we make this frequency smaller now, we should get proportionally larger wavelength. You can see the wavelength right now seems to be, I'd say the wavelength is about like that. And let's try going to about half this frequency. So this is 3.6 cycles per second. Let's go to about 1.8 cycles per second. Yeah, so now we see a much longer wavelength. It seems like, yeah, it's plausibly twice as long. So it seems now it's, it's like, so I think the excitation of this end of the wave machine is not perfectly sinusoidal, so we don't see, it's not, uh, oh, look at that, my lights just went out. So now it seems as if a plausible value for the wavelength is something like, that, I would say it's not really a standing wave anymore. It's a, like a little bit of a traveling wave, but that's pretty good. I think we don't have perfect damping at the far end here. Yeah, that's pretty good. I think we have a wavelength that's something like that now. And I think it's going to be hard to go down another factor of two, but I could try. So let me go down to 0.9 hertz and see what we see. So now that should double the wavelength again if we can get it to stabilize. Uh, you know, it's a little hard to see, but I think now 
think I see a wavelength about like that, kind of on the order of one meter. And then let me do this now by hand instead of with this motor. So I can go like that. That's pretty good. So now let me try doing that about twice as fast. Yeah. So you see about half the wavelength. And let me try going about a lot slower. It's pretty hard to make a good sinusoidal wave. It's that slow. But that's not bad. So that's a pretty long wavelength with a low frequency. And then I'll go a little faster. And you can see the wavelength gets smaller. And I'll go faster yet. Higher frequency. You can see the wavelength gets smaller yet. I'll try to go about twice as high in frequency. Let me see. Yeah. So I think that's pretty believable that the wavelength is inversely proportional to the frequency. And then the constant of proportionality is the speed at which waves propagate down the wave machine. And we can see that speed as the speed at which that pulse goes from one end to the other of the wave machine. So this pulse goes from one end to the other. And I worked out that I think it takes it takes uh, about 2.6 seconds for a wave to go from here all the way down to the other end of the wave machine. So finding the standing wave patterns for uh, a pipe that you blow air in is a little bit trickier than the standing wave patterns for a string because it's pretty common. Well, there are two common cases. One is a pipe that has both ends open, like here's an example. So this is open, and then the end that I blow in is also open. And in this case, so then actually in this case, the pattern is similar to what you get with a string, uh, except that it's kind of the opposite in that the displacement can be maximum on the end I'm blowing at, and the displacement can be maximum on the open end, but then uh, 90 degrees out of phase with the displacement pattern is the change in pressure pattern. And the pressure with respect to atmospheric, the change in pressure with respect to atmospheric is zero at the end here. So we just get atmospheric pressure here. And then at the other end, the, this other open end, the change in pressure with respect to atmospheric pressure is zero. But you can have a maximum pressure excursion here in the middle where the displacement is changing most rapidly. Uh, so, in this case, you get half a wave fitting in the complete length of the tube for the uh, lowest frequency, and then you get multiples of that. So you can have, uh, the length is a half wavelength, the length is one wavelength, the length is one and a half wavelengths, the length is two wavelengths, and so on. So here's the pattern of wavelengths you get. So then the frequency, which is the wave propagation speed divided by the wavelength, so you can get uh, wave speed over 2L times 1, times 2, times 3, times 4. So that looks pretty familiar from the guitar string. And you can also see that the frequency you get, the lowest frequency you get, is inversely proportional to the length. So if I have two very similar tubes, so these are, the, they, they, they look the same, but one is bigger. So this is the bigger one. Here's the smaller one, but they have the same basic shape. So you expect the smaller one to give you a higher frequency, the bigger one to give you a lower frequency. Makes sense from the formula because the length is downstairs here. It also makes sense from intuition because you know a, a mouse makes a higher pitch sound than a lion. Okay, so here is, in both of these cases, both ends are open. The end that I blow in is open, and you can see that this far end is open. So in this case, the allowed patterns are that half a wavelength, one wavelength, one and a half wavelengths, two wavelengths fit into the full length of the flute. And 
Uh, so then the fundamental frequency is the wave speed divided by twice the length. So this is a familiar result from the guitar string. And uh, you'll notice that th these two are similar, except that uh, this one's about twice as long as this one. So I claim that this one is going to play a note which is about an octave higher than this note because uh, this frequency is going to be about twice as high because you have the wave speed divided by two times the length. So the length is downstairs. So if you double the length, you'll, you'll half the fundamental frequency. Or if you half the length, you'll double the fundamental frequency. So, uh, and then that also makes sense from intuition because you say, well, the voice of a kitten is much higher pitched than the voice of a lion. So, you know, smaller animal higher pitch. Uh, so let's try making sounding both of these things. So here is the smaller one. And here's the one that's about twice as long. I think if I blow it hard, you can hear the overtones. And the overtone from this one sort of starts to sound like the, the fundamental from this one. Which I think kind of makes sense because you expect the next overtone to be double the fundamental frequency. But, okay, there's the fundamental from the short one. Fundamental from the long one. And again, if I blow hard enough to get some overtones too, I think you can hear that the next dominant overtone is about uh, an octave higher than, the, than the, the fundamental. Now, let's look what happens when instead we have one end closed. So the end that I blow in is still open, but I capped off the other end. So it kind of looks like this. So in that case, at the, at the end that I blow in, the displacement or velocity can be maximal. But you have a displacement node, also known as a velocity node. So the displacement is always zero at the far end because there's this obstacle preventing me from displacing the air over there. But the pressure at the end that I blow in stays at the ambient atmospheric pressure. But at the far end, I can have a maximum pressure excursion. So what you see here is a quarter wavelength fitting in the length of the tube in the lowest allowed mode. And then the next mode after that is where, you see if I just look at the pressure wave, here's a zero and here's a maximum. So I could say, well, zero and then maximum, and then it goes through zero again and then a minimum. So I could get uh, in this case, I have one quarter of a wavelength fitting in the length, and the next mode up would be three quarters of a wavelength fitting in the length, and the next mode up would be five quarters of a wavelength fitting in the length. So it's a sort of one, three, five pattern instead of the one, two, three pattern for the fundamental mode and then the overtones. But in any case, what you see is that for the lowest mode, and the lowest mode is the, the note that you sense that I'm playing, is the wave speed divided by four times the length, whereas for the both ends open case, we had the wave speed divided by two times the length. So it seems like uh, if I want to play the same note with the both ends open versus a one end closed, it seems like I need you see, I have to, in order to get this frequency to match this frequency, this length would have to be twice as big. So it seems like with the one end closed case, I can have half the length and get the same frequency. So actually, on the bottom is the, this is the one end closed case. 
this is the both ends open case. So in both cases, the mouthpiece is open, but uh, on, for, the, for this one, the far end is open. For this one, the far end is closed. And the place where it's closed off is right about here where my thumb is. So you can see that uh, it's plausible that it's a factor of two from here to uh, here versus here. So uh, I claim that the one that has both ends open to play the same note is about twice as long as the one that has one end open, one end closed, which kind of makes sense because we have this wave speed over 2L here, wave speed over 4L here. So to get the same frequency, the both ends open one has to be twice as long, so that this denominator will be the same. So let's see what happens when I try playing these two Seems like the same note. So the one that has both the mouth end and the far end open has to be twice as long to get the same frequency as the corresponding note for the one that has the mouth end open and the far end closed. Okay, I happen to have in my hand two examples of pipes of slightly different lengths, both of which have one end open, one end closed. And one of them is about one and a half times as long as the other. So let's compare their fundamental frequencies. Okay, yeah, so it seems like the length of this one is a little, I don't know, something on the order of one and a half times the length of this one. So I think then you expect to see like uh, this one to be higher in pitch than this one by, uh, I think that's something like a fifth. So like something like going from, something like going from C to G, I think. Anyway, a fraction of a musical scale, def, def, uh, not not you know, not a whole octave. So, this thing allows me to make a water column, and you can see it's kind of marked out in notes. So this says C D. E, F, G, A, B, C. And uh, so I think I can bring the water level up to here, and then up to here, and then up to here, and so on. Let's see how that goes. So we have here a column of air. So the, you can see the green level of water here, and then you can see this white PVC pipe. And by moving this pipe up and down, you can see where the water, water level is. Now the water level goes on the bottom, goes up and down a little bit as I move the pipe up. But in any case, the column of air inside this narrow pipe that I'm holding in my right hand has a length that you can see from the top of the pipe to the water level. So you know that if you can see the water outside the pipe, the water will be at the same level inside the pipe where you can't see it. And then we also know that somehow we will get that pipe to play a different note depending on how long we make it. It'll resonate at a different frequency. For instance, maybe you can't hear that. I can just barely hear it myself, but Oh, 
Okay. That's, that was kind of an unplanned, not necessarily great effect. When you have a pipe which is open at one end and closed at the other, then the fundamental frequency, the lowest frequency you can get, is where the amplitude is, or where, where the wave has uh, a minimum here and a maximum here. So that's a quarter of a wave fitting in the length. And I think I drew this on the board over here. So the fundamental mode, the lowest frequency mode you can get with a pipe which is closed on one end and open on the other, is that one quarter of a wave fits there. The next one after that is that three quarters of a wave fit there. So you have a zero, and then there's another maximum and a zero, and then you have another uh, maximum at the far end. So the next mode up is three quarters of a wavelength equals the length. But anyway, the fundamental is that one quarter of a wavelength equals the length. And we know the speed of sound in room temperature air is 343 meters per second. And I happen to have here a tuning fork which is tuned for 341 hertz, 341.3. So that's... That turns out to be F4. Uh, so that's convenient. So 341 hertz is pretty much the same number as 343 meters per second. So then the wavelength is right about 1.0 meter. So then a quarter of a wavelength would be 25 centimeters. So let's see what happens when we take this tuning fork and we adjust the length of this tube until it's pretty close to 25 centimeters. Now I know I can hear it and I'm going to try to position my microphone so you can hear it too. So You can see, okay, I can hear this is pretty loud for me right now. And from the top of the PVC tube to the top of the green water level, you can see is about two and a half stripes. Each stripe is 10 centimeters, so that's about 25 centimeters. Now let me try to make that more obvious to you. I'm gonna try to move the end of my microphone over to the end of the tube here. I hope this works. And, and I'll get the tuning fork going. seems like the best resonance is when we're right around 25 centimeters. Now we should be able to get a pretty good resonance also at 75 centimeters. Let me just try to figure out where that is. Well, okay, well, let's, let's listen for it. Yeah, there's another pretty good resonance up there. And then if we look, here's two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven and a half stripes. So that's pretty good. So we had got one pretty good resonance between the tuning fork and the pipe at when the length of the tube was 25 centimeters. The length of the tube was a quarter of a wavelength. And then we got another pretty good resonance when we lengthened this so that the length of the air column, in other words, from the top of the tube to the top of the green column of water was 75 centimeters. So then we saw that the uh, length of the column of air was three quarters of a wavelength. Now, let's try something very similar. This is 341 hertz, so that's the F above middle C, so that's F4. This is 262 hertz, 261.6, 262, so this is middle C. So let's try it with middle C. So middle C, I worked this out on the board, uh, has a wave, so it's 262 hertz, has a wavelength of 1.3 meters. 
So then a quarter of a wavelength would be 33 centimeters. Or of course then if we go up to three times that, that would be one meter. I don't know if we can do one meter. So let's give that a try. So we're going to see if we can get 33, see if we get a nice resonance of 33 centimeters. I'll put your microphone back here and that's pretty good. That seems to be, there's one, two, three, just a little over three stripes. That seems about right. So I could believe that's about 33 centimeters. Now let's see what happens. Let's see if we can go up to uh, three times that and get another resonance. I think if I move this thing down to the ground. Then maybe I can hear it. So that's pretty decent. So that seems plausibly like 33 centimeters. So it turns out that there's a professor at Penn State University that has some good animations of longitudinal waves. And remember, longitudinal waves are quite a bit harder to visualize than transverse waves. Uh, you often see graphs that look like these blue graphs with the red red traces in textbooks, and it's hard to interpret those to figure out what the motion of the constituent particles in the wave really looks like. So uh, Professor Russell from Penn State uh, decided to make an animation to try to make it a little easier for you to see that. So here you see a piston moving back and forth on the left-hand side, and this is a pipe which is basically open on one side and closed on the other. and uh, you can see that there is a velocity or displacement node on the right side because it's a closed right end. There's a pressure anti-node corresponding to that velocity node. And then you see on the left side where the piston is, there was a pressure node but a velocity anti-node. You say, okay, here is the, on the top left, you see the lowest possible frequency. That's the fundamental frequency, uh, standing wave pattern for a pipe which is closed on one end closed on the right, open on the left. So you can see a quarter wave fits in the top left case, and then a, a, then a three quarters of a wave fits in the top right case. And then we go down, and in this case, five quarters of a wave fit. And then in the bottom right case, seven quarters of a wave fit. And you can see uh, the kind of cool pattern. And so we can make an analogy between an organ pipe, let's say... And so we can make an analogy between an organ pipe, let's say it's an organ pipe where both ends are open, or it could be both ends are closed, but anyways, let's say we have the same boundary condition on both ends. We can say both ends of the organ pipe are open, and we make it resonate, and there's air inside resonating, so the medium is air, whereas over here, we had a string, both ends of the string are anchored, and we're looking for standing waves, and we have some tension, and we have some mass per unit length. So if we have sound waves in an organ pipe, instead of tension divided by the mass per unit length of the string, that same square root is replaced instead by the bulk modulus, which is the elastic modulus of the air, divided by the density of the air. So, uh, or essentially what you can see, replacing the mass per unit length of the string, we have the density of the air. Now the density of ordinary air is proportional to the mass per molecule, or mass per mole of molecules, of the constituents of air. Air is about 80% nitrogen, which is N2, about 
21% oxygen, which is O2, and then there are trace amounts of other things like argon and CO2 and so on. So anyway, uh, nitrogen, about 28 grams per mole. Now what if we replace the nitrogen with helium? So helium is about four, is four grams per mole because a helium nucleus is two protons, two neutrons. Uh, so if we, if the downstairs in that square root goes from 28 to four, then that's making the downstairs a factor of seven smaller. So it's making that whole square root, of the inside of that square root a factor of seven bigger. And the square root of seven is kind of two and a half, a little less than three. So each one of my resonant frequencies, let's say of my windpipe, should be about two and a half, three times higher if I breathe helium instead of breathing air. So let's give it a try. Now, it may already be obvious to you, it'll be more obvious to you in a moment, I do not have a good singing voice. I could try to sing, I go, Toreador on guard, if you go to Carmen. Okay, that's pretty, pretty poor, but let's try this. Let's see what happens if I fill my lungs with helium and we'll see what uh, the Carmen Toreador song with my poor singing voice sounds like then. Toreador on guard, Toreador, Toreador. Songe bien, oui, songe bien en combattant, qu'on a noir to regard. Hey, that's pretty good. Oh, I'm still breathing the helium. Da 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 da. I should really get the helium out of my lung. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, okay, good, good. So, not bad, right? So it seems like it's about two and a half times, should be, well, according to the calculation, should be like about two and a half times the pitch if I breathe the helium and sing the same thing. So, eh, I don't know. So you know that when two waves going opposite directions meet, they don't behave quite the same way as two particles do. They don't bounce off of one another. They pass right through one another, but their amplitudes add. So if you have two waves meet where they're both peaks, then when they meet, you'll get a bigger peak. And if you have two waves meet where one is a peak and one is a trough, a trough or a valley, then when they meet, they'll add to zero. So when two waves meet and they have the same phase, they're either both up or both down. That's called constructive interference, and the result is a bigger wave. When you have two waves meet, and one is up and one is down, then that's called destructive interference, and they cancel one another out. This kind of obnoxious sounding tone that you hear, it's 880 hertz, so it's A5, so that's the A above the A above middle C. And uh, the speed of sound in room temperature air is 343 meters per second. So a frequency, a wave of 880 hertz frequency in room temperature air has a wavelength, speed of sound divided by frequency, wavelength of 39 centimeters. So a little less than four tenths of a meter. So what we're gonna see is, we're gonna measure this tube here and you'll see that there's a speaker down here. There's a speaker down here. And then there's a microphone up here. And the wave that comes out of this speaker, the tone that comes out of the speaker can take two paths. There's the right hand path or no, that's the left-hand path. There's the left-hand path, or there's the right-hand path. And how long are those two paths? If we look at this path, this is 40, 80 centimeters. And then I go over to this side, that's another 40 centimeters. And I go over to this side, and that's another 80. So that's one, two waves, one more, and then one, two waves, two plus one plus two is five total wavelengths 
I come over and I look at this side, it's going to be the same thing initially. There's one wavelength, two wavelengths, three total wavelengths, and then two more, that's five. So I kind of drew that over here. So the left path, here's two wavelengths, one wavelength, two more, that's a total of five wavelengths. The right-hand path, two wavelengths, one wavelength, two more wavelengths. But this side is adjustable. So this, we could make this say two and a quarter, and then one, and two and a quarter. So then instead of a total of five on the right side, we'll have five and a half, or so on. So if I subtract or add, if I change this length by 10 centimeters, I'm simultaneously changing this length by 20, 10 centimeters. So I'm changing the total path length here by 20 centimeters, which is half a wavelength. So every time I move this by 10 centimeters, so this is 10 centimeters, um, going from constructive to destructive interference, or then from destructive back to constructive interference. So we're going to see that two ways. First, you can hear it with your own ear. You can, it's as if you were sticking your ear in there because uh, your ear will be my microphone. So let me do that first. Apologies here. So what you're going to see, you're, it's going to be loud right now. I'm going to make this 10 centimeters shorter, but the total path length is in 20 centimeters shorter. I'm going to make this shorter, and it'll become destructive interference. And then I'll make it back to the original length, so it'll be, it'll be loud again, constructive. And then I'll make, bring it out to the next mark, and you'll hear destructive interference. It'll become quiet. And the next mark, it'll become constructive again. It'll be loud. So listen for that. Okay, so you heard that with your ear or with this microphone. Now let's watch it on an oscilloscope. So an oscilloscope is a way of displaying visually an electronic signal. So we can display visually the electronic signal that comes out of this microphone. So we'll put Mr. Microphone in here. Turn the amplitude up, the volume. And now you see two waves on this oscilloscope. The bottom signal is being played out by the speaker on the bottom. The top signal is being picked up by the microphone on the top. And you can see they're both about the same size right now. Now I'm going to decrease the left hand, decrease the right hand path by half a wavelength. And we'll see what happens to the top trace, the microphone. So, and you can see that this trace is now just about flat, so it's a much smaller amplitude. And we'll go back out to the original length. So I changed this length by 10 centimeters. That changes, of course, this length by the same. So it changes the total path length by 20 centimeters. So now it's loud again. You can see the big wave here. And we'll go and make this another 10 centimeters bigger, and it'll do the same thing on the bottom since they move together. And so that should be destructive interference again. And indeed, we see the nice flat waveform. And then we'll go out another 10 centimeters. And this should be constructive interference again. And indeed, you see the big wave there again. And then we can go back to the original, where it's constructive. Yeah, so if we have five, exactly five wavelengths on the top, on exactly five wavelengths on the left, exactly five wavelengths on the right. You get constructive interference. We change it so it's still five on the left, but it's only four and a half on the right. Now you have destructive interference. So if the wave is a peak, 
on one side it's a valley on the other and they cancel each other and the sound becomes very quiet neat so I made a little animation to sort of do the same thing you saw in that previous demonstration so you imagine that the speaker is on the bottom and that uh, the microphone is on the top and the wave is uh, emanating in both directions from the bottom and then in the case where they reach the top they go the same path length left and right so you see that the ball going up and down which reflects the sum of the two waves is waving up and down with a big amplitude and then I can make uh, one of the paths a little shorter than the other and by moving the slider and I think uh, you see now they're basically out of phase. I guess I didn't quite get it perfectly out of phase. And oh, I think I can make it even better. Yeah. Okay. So that's pretty good. You know, see, I can move it just so, so then they cancel and the ball stops moving. Oh, that's nice. So then I've got destructive interference between the blue and the red. So the blue ball stops moving. And then I guess I can go over here and I can make uh, the path length, one of the path lengths longer again. And again, if I just the right, yep, so if I do it just right, then I get nice destructive interference and the little black ball stops going up and down when the red wave and the blue wave uh, arrive uh, just opposite one another and cancel each other out. So that is sort of a visual equivalent of what you just heard and saw in that uh, kind of adjustable uh, phase example with the 40 centimeter wavelength. So here I have two tuning forks and each one of them is a 440 hertz tuning fork. There's one. There's the other. Oh, and in fact, if I strike one of them, I can actually get this one to keep resonating because they're so close together in frequency that the sound coming out of this one excites the other one. So they're very close to, they're both very, very high quality factor oscillators and they're very close together in frequency. So if I start this one going. This one goes too. Let's see if you can hear that better this way. I'll start this one going. And I'll stop this one. And this one is still going. Okay, that's pretty good, but that's not really what I wanted to show you. Uh, so these are both very, very close to 440 hertz. If I take a little piece of math, this is a tiny little rubber band, and I put it on the end of this tuning fork, that additional mass, basically it adds a little bit more inertia. And you know that when things vibrate back and forth, the frequency at which they naturally vibrate back and forth often goes like the square root of some kind of elasticity divided by some kind of inertia. So we're adding more inertia here. So that should lower the resonant frequency a little bit. It should make things go a little bit more slowly because it's adding a little bit more inertia, but it's not really changing the elasticity of this tuning fork. So now if I strike these two tuning forks, get them both going at the same time, you'll hear kind of an interesting phenomenon called beats. And I can make that even a little more obvious by adding a second, so we'll add a little bit more inertia to this one. So now we'll get this one going and get this one going. Let's do that again. Thank <laughs> you. 
Let's do it one more time. And the analogy for this is you imagine that you are running around a circular racetrack and your friend is also running around a circular racetrack. So if you are going around five times an hour and your friend is going around four times an hour, then you'll lap each other once per hour. And if you're going around five times an hour and your friend is going around three times an hour, then you'll lap each other twice per hour, and so on. So the beat frequency, the wah, 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 wah beat frequency equals the difference in these two frequencies. So this is a bigger difference in frequency, so it's a faster beat frequency. If I change that and make that inertia difference a little smaller, so the frequency difference is a little smaller, smaller frequency difference means a smaller beat frequency, which means you'll hear it wah, wah less often. So this actually is how, in the old days, before the days of electronic piano tuning devices, is how a piano tuner would know if your, uh, you know, if a given note on your piano was in tune. It was by listening to the beat frequency between a tuning fork and uh, the strings on your piano. Now. This is kind of nice because it's just a mechanical device, low tech. But I set up the same thing with two function generators, each one connected to a speaker. And I'm gonna zoom in the video camera on it. So I will put the microphone once again, well, I'll put the microphone over here somewhere. And this is 440 hertz, 440 hertz. Now let's make one of them be 441 hertz. Now let's make that one be 442 hertz, so 442 and 440. Now let's make it 443. Four forty-four. Okay, now let's go back down to four forty-one. Now here's something interesting. I'm gonna go from 441 down to 439. Now 438. Now 437. and then 436. So you can only get the absolute value of the difference in frequencies. You can't get the absolute difference in frequency, but you know if you're tightening a string, you, you know if you're tightening a string that the frequency of the piano is going up, or if you're loosening a string, the frequency of the piano is going down. So you can tell, okay, I'm getting closer, and you know which one's going up or which one's going down. So then you can figure out the absolute value of the difference by seeing what happens when you change the tension in a string. And a higher tension piano string means a higher frequency. Okay, so that's beats. You can hear the beats.